Welcome to AstroCast.TV, your source for news and information about astronomy and our solar system. Now, here is your host, NASA JPL Solar System Ambassador, Greg Redfern. It's episode five, and we're off to multiple planets, including our own Earth. Hello, and welcome once again to AstroCast.TV. Also in this episode, Dr. Harold Geller will be answering some of your email questions and from the National Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C., I'll be talking to Katie Moore who will give us a night sky update for the month of August. <laughs> Mars is a busy place as NASA's Phoenix spacecraft continues to operate in the Martian Arctic, taking additional samples and monitoring the Martian environment. In more Mars news, Two studies recently published and based upon NASA's Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter data provides evidence that the red planet once hosted vast lakes, flowing rivers, and a variety of other wet environments that had the potential to support life. The areas studied may be excellent locations to search for Martian life. The European Space Agency has been doing a series of close flybys of the inner Martian moon Phobos using its Mars Express spacecraft at closest approach Mars Express will only be 97 kilometers away from the tiny moon. The images will reveal details never seen before and help scientists decode the mysteries of this fascinating moon. Leaving Mars, we swing by Mercury, the closest planet to the sun. The first science results from NASA's Messenger spacecraft flyby of Mercury in January 2008 revealed that the planet has an active magnetic field with a north and south magnetic pole similar to Earth's. This finding came as a surprise to some scientists as it means that Mercury must have an active hot liquid iron core to produce the observed results. Most scientists previously thought that Mercury's magnetic field was a relic of the past, frozen in the outer crust. Another big discovery is finding evidence of past volcanic activity inside the huge Caloris impact basin. The light colored area in the photograph is thought to be evidence of an explosive volcanic eruption deposit. Closer to home, our very own Earth-Moon system got the lead role in a movie made of the pair by NASA's Deep Impact spacecraft from a distance of 31 million miles. In the video, you can clearly see our planet as it rotates on its axis and the Moon crossing in front of Earth. This is the most detailed video ever made of the pair and will be used to help look for characteristics that can be used in the search for Earth-like planets orbiting stars. Did you know that our solar system now has a fourth officially named dwarf or plutoid class planet? The International Astronomical Union, the organization that names objects in the solar system, finally approved the name Maki Maki for 2005 FY9, discovered by Mike Brown and colleagues in March 2005 at Mount Palomar Observatory. Like Mike says in his blog, three years is a long time to have a license plate for a name. Not to be left out, the king of the planets, Jupiter, had an interesting convergence of storm spots last month that led to the deformation of the smallest of the three storm spots, only half the size of our whole planet. As imaged by Hubble Space Telescope, the baby storm spot did not survive the encounter with a 340-year-old storm called the Great Red Spot. The little red spot lost its red color and spherical shape but was clocked by the New Horizon spacecraft as having some of the highest wind speeds on Jupiter. Astronomers will be watching to see what happens next and we'll be learning more about the New Horizon spacecraft that's en route to Pluto in future episodes of AstroCath.TV. Jupiter has a strong presence in our night sky this August. Now Katie Moore from the National Air and Space Museum is here to tell us what's up for the month of August. Thanks, Greg. Have you noticed a bright star-like light in the night sky lately? It's probably the planet Jupiter. Jupiter is near the constellation Sagittarius this month, and it's visible all night. It's now directly opposite from the sun, rising when the sun sets and setting when the sun rises. It will be close to the nearly full moon on the nights of August 12 and 13 to help you pick it out. One of the best meteor showers of the year comes in August. The Perseids will put on a show from the 10th of August through the 14th. Meteor showers are named after the constellation the shooting stars appear to radiate away from, and in this case, the constellation is Perseids. The, the best way to view the Perseids is to go outside to a dark site after 1 o'clock or 2 o'clock in the morning and look in the general direction of the constellation Perseids, toward the east. You don't need special equipment, just your eyes. The best
best night to look is at the peak of the shower, expected to be on August 12th, after the moon sets at 2 o'clock in the morning. You may see as many as 50 shooting stars per hour. August kicks off with a spectacular event on the first of the month, an eclipse of the sun. Whenever there's a solar eclipse, you can bet that there will be an eclipse of the moon about two weeks later or earlier. This month is no exception. Lunar eclipses occur at full moon when the Earth gets directly between the sun and moon, blocking out the sun's light from illuminating our satellite world. This partial lunar eclipse will be visible on the night of August 16th through 17th for those of you who are anywhere but North America. Unfortunately for our viewers in almost all of North America, the eclipse will end before the moon rises for the night. Now back to Greg Redfern. Katie Moore from the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum. Thanks, Katie. Now let's go to the Herschel Observatory at George Mason University, where Dr. Harold Geller will take some of your questions. Oh, hi, Craig. Thank you. And welcome to George Mason University's Herschel Observatory Control Room. I'm going to address some of the questions that we received here at AstroCast.tv. This one from Kent. He asks, what causes a supernova explosion? And if the star has no fusion reactions, shouldn't it just collapse in on itself? Well, Kent, there are many different types of supernovae reactions. The ones you most hear about in the media are supernovae type 1A and supernovae type 2. With a supernovae type 2 explosion, you're looking at a supergiant star that ends its fusion in the core and collapses in on itself, as you noted. However, these supergiants don't just have fusion taking place in the core. Unlike our own sun, fusion is taking place in layers around the core. Once its core ceases its fusion reactions, the outer layers begin to push in. In fact, they push in so much so that they're able to take the electrons and shove them into the nucleus, forming a neutron star. But just like a ball hitting a wall, it's going to bounce off. And the outer layers then rebound, and that gives you one of the largest explosions we know of in the universe, that of a supernovae explosion. Now, in the case of supernova of the type 1A, that requires a binary star system. You would have a white dwarf orbiting a large giant star, and the giant star gets to a point where material comes to the white dwarf. When enough material builds up on that white dwarf, it too will undergo a collapse, just like we talked about before. And the electrons will be shoved into the nucleus, and the protons neutralize, and you have all neutrons. And a similar rebound gives you a specific luminosity of the explosion of a white dwarf supernova explosion. That's all the time I have for right now. Don't forget, if you have a question, address it to astrocast.tv, and we'll do our best to get an answer to you. Now back to you, Greg. Thanks, Harold. Tune in next time as we learn more about the wonders and mysteries of the universe in which we live and explore.